Hi, my name is Tony Tabor and I'm from the City Clerk's Office um, and we're going to go through the Boards and Commissions training. Um, you'll notice it, it lists Neelam Naidu as Senior Deputy City Attorney. She does give us advice. She will not be present for the recording of this video. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is the Annual Work Plan and Reports, the Brown Act Parliamentary Procedures, which is also Robert's Rules of Order or Rosenberg's Rules of Order, City Council Policy 04, San Jose City Charter, the San Jose Municipal Code, Form 700s, and Ethics and Sexual Harassment Training, which does not apply to everybody who is on a Border Commission. It just applies to some of them. So the, free, the terms you're going to hear us say a lot Council Policy 04. Um, a lot of times we'll just say 040404, and most people who aren't on a border commission don't necessarily know what that means. But that is our policy related to boards and commissions. And it says what, what does a chair do? What's the role of the secretary? What's the role of the city staff? Um, what are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? So it's actually one of the most important documents for a border commission member to read through. Um, it was, we did have a comprehensive update in 2016, um, but we have done some minor revisions after that as well. And we're working on a revision right now. You'll also hear us talk about charter commissions. Charter commissions are commissions specifically created in the city charter, and so those cannot be dissolved unless we go to a vote of the people. So these were created um, by the vote of the citizens of San Jose, and that's the Planning Commission, Civil Service Commission, and Salary Setting Commission. Um, and then we have, these are the other types of boards. So we have advisory bodies, that's most of the commissions. That means they don't make any decisions, they advise the council. So Arts Commission can advise the council to, on where to place public art, or the um, Downtown Parking Board, which I've never attended a meeting, so I can't tell you what they talk about. But they can advise the council. They can actually make decisions. Decision-making bodies, these are ones that actually make a decision that can po um, possibly be appealed later to council, um, but they make their own decisions, such as Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices, which I'll usually use that as an example because I attend those. Those are complaints that come in against city council um, campaigns, um, and they can fine people or or listen to a hearing and tell, make a decision on whether somebody violated a rule or not. Okay, so going to the annual work plans. These are required by the City Municipal Code and it's um, updated every year for all the different city commissions and it lets the council know what the commissions are planning to do. This is partly so a commission doesn't go rogue, so you don't have, say, an arts commission that all of a sudden is super interested in parking, um, because it goes to the work plan and the council could say, no, that's not what you're, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. So the work plan is so the council knows what the commissions are planning on doing. Now, some commissions, their work plan may be the same every year, because like the ethics commission or board of fair campaigning public practices, they um, pretty much do the same thing every year. They listen to hearings, they review Title 12, they review. Um, their resolu rules resolution. So it's the same every year and then they might add a special project now and then. It would include a budget of costs. Um, the Most of the commissions don't have a separate budget. They um, c It comes out of the budget of the department. So the council needs to know are you going to have a commission that is going to spend a lot of money doing all these special reports or not. Um, so those are all important things for them to do. And at the same time, they bring in an annual report to let the council know what they did do. Um, because you want to make sure you have commissions that actually do something and are not just a waste of everybody's time. Because it's a lot of time for you, the commissioner, um, to spend um, in these commissions. And then those go to the designated council committee. Some go to rules, some go to neighborhood services, um, some go to PISFIS which is public safety and financial and strategic support. So you don't, don't normally call them by their names. Okay, the other, the other term, oh, here's, sorry, here's a slide on the designated, the designated council committee. So airport, any, all the airport documents go through transportation and environment, arts goes to community economic development, et cetera. So the Brown Act, this is, you, you'll hear all the time whenever you, our commissioner or a city employee 
or in any especially local government agencies the brown act is for local government meetings it does not apply to state government so it is ralph m brown it's not governor brown a lot of people assumed it, it was either edmund brown or um, jerry brown but it was neither it's ralph m brown um, and it's old and this is to ensure local government meetings are open and public and you don't have people making backroom deals it applies to any legislative body so that includes boards, commissions, and subcommittees because those are created by the legislative body. So it's either the legislative body or a body created by the legislative body. Um, exceptions are single purpose temporary subcommittees formed of less than a quorum. And our local rule, so the Sunshine Resolution, that's a city of San Jose resolution, that um, limits them to six months or less. We do occasionally get boards and commissions that try to bypass the Brown Act by creating an ad hoc committee and just recreating it every six months, but they're not allowed to do that. Sorry for those of you listening to the recording. Okay, so Brown Act meeting is any congregation of a majority of the members of the legislative body at the same time and location to hear, discuss, deliberate, or take action on any item within the subject matter jurisdiction. What does this mean? It means a regularly scheduled meeting. It could mean four people out of a five people commission meeting at a restaurant or having a barbecue who start to talk about their work, even though they didn't plan on it. All of a sudden, they've, they violated the Brown Act. So you cannot have a barbecue and invite your, all of your Neighborhoods Commission members to this barbecue and then talk about anything related to Neighborhoods Commission, which can be particularly difficult for the Neighborhoods Commission because just talking about if whether or not a person's mowed their lawn down the street could really be a violation because that's neighborhood issues. So it's something people need to take seriously. Um, not a meeting, individual contacts by members of the public, attending a conference together, attending, say, a council meeting together, um, attending an election debate, um, attending an open and noticed meeting of another body, or attending a social function. So attending an open and noticed meeting of another body, say, go, going to the Board of Supervisors. So if you have five members of a six-member body, going to a board of supervisors meeting or council meeting it's not a violation or attending a social function like a holiday party not a not a violation unless you start to talk about the items that you're not supposed to talk about um, so we do tell people to be really careful about meeting people for coffee and, and what you talk about all of a sudden when you're elected or a commission member some things that seem really like innocuous are now a problem even like wedding gifts can sometimes be an issue so you do just have to be a little more cognizant of what you're doing there's also different types of meetings these are the this is where most of the violations from a commission are going to happen serial meetings such as a daisy chain or a hub and spoke so daisy chain is member a talks to member b member b then talks to member c all about the same topic so like say using the council members as an example if mayor Licardo talks to um, council member Wynn about parking and then council member Wynn then talks to council member Jones about parking now essentially Jones has talked with the mayor even though they haven't actually spoken so the council members will a lot of times keep a uh, like a list of who they've talked to about different things so they don't accidentally violate the daisy chain um, another is hub and spoke so say i talk to john smith and then i talk to john pertwee and then i talk to tom baker and then i talk to peter davison i've only talked to one per they've all talked to one person i've talked to a mul multiple of them so i can essentially poll them to see what their their opinions are so that's also a violation and this also goes with staff. So if you have um, council staff who talk to each other, that can then become a violation as well. Okay, so I do have a, a person in the office with me while I record this, and he had a question. And he wants to clarify the, the member A talking to member B. Um, if just, to, as long as it's less than a quorum, you're okay. So if you have a five-member group, 
and member A talks to member B and that's it. And they don't talk to anybody else. They have not violated the Brown Act. But when they loop in member C, that becomes three of five and that's a quorum. A quorum is half plus one. But if you have like 11 members, half is five and a half, which you don't have half a person. So quorum is, is not six and a half, it's just six. Um, so that's a quorum. So as long as you have less than a quorum, you're okay. Um, a email reply to all can be another issue. We make sure that we advise people don't reply to all, even if it's just for scheduling a meeting, because if one person accidentally says, oh yeah, I'm available on that day because I really hate the topic we're talking about. I want to make sure I'm there to express my opinion. It's like, oh, now you've just told everybody that you've got an opinion and what your, your opinions are and you've told everybody. Now everybody's involved, so just don't hit reply all, which is actually good in all situations. Don't hit reply all. Um, unless you mean to. So, um, prohibited meeting staff briefings are allowed, so you are allowed to meet with with like department staff to get information. And staff may contact a commissioner to answer questions or provide information if the staff member does not communicate the comments or position of any other commissioner. So that's the main thing is stick to yourself, remove your own opinions and not say, oh, I was talking to John the other day and I know what John's thinking. So just keep it to yourself. What is the Brown Act? It's not just about how to talk to each other. It's about what we need to put on the agenda. So you'll of often be heard, oh, we can't talk about that because it's not on the agenda. It's a violation of the Brown Act. The agenda requires a brief description of each item of business to be transacted or discussed at the meeting. It doesn't need to exceed 20 words, although if you look at our council agendas, they almost all exceed 20 words. They need to have enough detail to allow a person who is not familiar with their commission to determine whether or not they should attend. So it needs to be specific enough that a lay person can look at it and know what they're going to talk about. You can't just say public hearing to discuss um, parking. It needs to be more specific. Brown Act requires public comment on all items. Um, it's limited to items within the scope of the commission's subject matter jurisdiction. It's required for all regular meetings. We also include public comment and special meetings as a general rule for the City Council because it, it's highly recommended. Um, it's uh, quite frankly easier to allow people to speak than to tell them not to speak anyway. But the city standard is two minutes, but the chair can um, limit that time when appropriate. If so, if you have 100 speakers, you know that's going to be 200 minutes of speaking time. That's like a long time, <laughs> not quite two hours, but um, wait. Anyway, you can limit it to one minute and you'll see that the, the mayor will do that. If we have like a full house and there, we know there's going to be 100 people then he'll limit it to one minute. Um, speakers using a translator get twice the amount of time. So if you've limited it to one minute, they get two minutes. If it's two minutes, they get four. It's to allow two the speaker to have their full two minutes and then the translator to translate what they've said. Um, responding to issues not on the agenda. You can refer the speaker to staff. You can refer the speaker to appropriate reference material. Like you could say, oh, you can find that in the municipal code. It's in Title 12. Um, you, you can request the staff to report back at a future meeting. So if somebody's come to a meeting and has brought something to your attention that you find interesting, you can say, you know, staff, I would like you to look into what the speaker was talking about and let us know what's happening. Um, and you can direct staff to place the matter on a future agenda. But you cannot, you cannot engage with the public speaker to, um, ta to get into a big discussion about that item because it was not agendized. So sometimes if you're watching a council meeting, you think, well, why didn't they just like start talking to the person? It's like they really can't. It's easier to just not engage them. But a lot of times the mayor will tell the person, you know, you know, stay right there. We'll have staff come talk to you and get your information. So the Brown Act versus City Sunshine. So Brown Act is a pain for a lot of smaller cities. Um, and we've made it even more restrictive here at the city of San Jose. So the Brown Act, we have a 72 hour um, requirement city sunshine at seven days ahead of time so if you're coming into this border commission and you've served um, in another capacity in another city and you're used to the Brown Act and it's like well we have 72 hours it's like no we have seven days and if we're gonna violate sunshine we have to get a sunshine waiver so we try not to do that um, special meetings are four days not 24 hours 
uh, minutes need to be posted for boards and commissions within 10 days and it can just say draft. Um, we maintain audio recordings for up to two years um, and staff reports need to be posted seven days with the agenda. Um, you'll notice Brown Act doesn't even require staff reports to be posted. They only require the agenda. The staff reports just have to be provided at the same time they're given to the, the board. So sometimes you may get nothing because the board got nothing, but as soon as the board gets it, the public has to have it. Okay, Political Reform Act. So now that we're done with Brown Act, there's Political Reform Act. We have a lot of rules we have to follow when you're in city government. Um, this is basically conflict of interest issues. A commissioner must recuse um, himself or herself if there's a disqualifying financial interest. That could include like a spouse working for a company. So say you have, I'm, I'll go to Arts Commission because they're early in the alphabet so I tend to use them. <laughs> so Arts Commission say um, they want to do recommendations for who to give grants to. If Commissioner Smith has a spouse who works for uh, one of the art museums here, they would need to recuse themselves from whether or not recommending funds to go to that art museum because they have a vested financial interest. It could also be your property values will increase or decrease based on a decision um, made by the city council or the commission. So um, it's any reasonable foreseeable material financial effect um, directly on the official or his or her immediate family. So the immediate family includes spouse, children. Um, it does not include second cousin. If you, if there is a disqualifying financial interest, you need to disclose the interest on a form that we have prior to the action and recuse yourself from participating in any way in the decision. You are allowed to speak for your two minute public comment though. Um, so we're going to move on. What is a decision? A decision is making or attempting to influence a decision. So basically all of your commission actions will qualify. Financial interest includes source, sources of your family income or gifts, business entities, real property, or your family's personal finances. Material means significant, and there are specific tests for each type of financial interest. That's something we would communicate with the attorney's office if we had any questions. So I would not be able to tell you what your, if it's your financial interest, but the city attorney's office can make that determination. Um, and it's reasonably foreseeable is determined by state tests. Again, we would refer it to whoever the attorney is that's linked to your commission. Real property, I, I've gone too far. Um, it's source of income of $500 or more. Your own income, promised income, income of spouse, domestic partner, child, and loans. Um, real property interests of $2,000 or more. Um, I believe this also includes rent. So if you have a real property interest of $2,000 or more, you could have a conflict of interest if a city decision affects the property. Real property interest includes having a rental lease unless it is a month-to-month -month lease. There's a 500 foot rule that says if your property is located within 500 feet of property that is subject of a governmental decision, the financial impacts of the decision on your property are presumed to be material, so you cannot participate in the decision unless you have received written advice from the state that the decision will have no measurable impact on the value of your property. Again, that's something we would direct you to the city attorney's office for further advice if needed. Other kinds of interests, um, we won't go into detail. If you have any questions on these um, that come before your commission, consult with your commission secretary and your commission's attorney. Gifts, businesses, investments. Remember I, I mentioned wedding gifts a little bit ago. This is where things like that can come in. If it's a wedding gift from somebody that you've known for years, it's not a big deal. If it's a wedding gift from somebody that you've only really met after being a commissioner, that can become an issue. So that's the kind of things that um, we'll consult with your secretary and your attorney. Um, excuse me. The city has a $50 gift limit, which is less than the state's $470 limit. So you cannot accept gifts that are valued more than 50. If you think you have a conflict, 
recuse yourself on the record from participation in discussion or voting and refrain from attempting to influence the decision. You are not required to leave the dais. You may leave the dais and speak as a member of the public with respect to interests that are solely your own. Um, note the recusal can pose voting and quorum issues. If you have a, rec a person who recuses and now you've lost your quorum, you can't talk about the, the item until you have a quorum. <coughs> okay, so we're moving on to wait. city's revolving door. We do have a re revolving um, door policy for Form 700 commissioners. If you're a commissioner that has to file a Form 700, which we're going to talk about later, this policy applies to you. This means that for two years after leaving the commission, you cannot represent anyone else, whether or not for compensation before the commission um, on which you served, including public comment, unless you're representing yourself. This is in the municipal code and there's no waiver. So this means if you have left the um, Parks and Recreation Commission and somebody hires you to go speak to the Parks and Recreation Commission to advocate for something, you can't do it, not for two years. Um, but you can go speak to the Parks and Recreation Commission as a member of the public to talk about your neighborhood park or to talk about whatever issues that you personally want to talk about, but you cannot do that for compensation or even not for compensation on behalf of anybody. So this company, hey, can you go talk to them? No. And you can talk to your attorneys about that as well. So we're moving on to parliamentary procedures. This is actually probably the biggest issues to talk about with boards and commissions other than Brown Act. Um, parliamentary procedures are also known as Robert's Rules of Order or Rosenberg's Rules of Order. Now you guys on the video can't see me. If you came in person you'd see I hold up this really thick book. It's called Robert's Rules of Order. It's 704 pages long. Um, we don't really follow it because it's 704 pages long and it's very detailed. It's a lot of what you can do in Robert's Rules of Order, you cannot do because of the Brown Act. So we use uh, something called Rosenberg's Rules of Order, which is take, it's, it's items taken from Robert's Rules of Order, not rewritten, pulled out that are specific to what's allowed with local governments in the city of Cal the state of California. It's still Robert's Rules of Order, it's just a lot easier because it's like four pages long, not 704 pages. And what this does, it establishes a quorum. Um, it note, you note absences for the record, you note arrivals and departures for the record. So if John Smith comes in 10 minutes late, you note that in the minutes. If he leaves 10 minutes early, you note that in the minutes. If they're absent for a vote, it's noted. Um, you should announce the agenda item number and subject. So if you're the chair, you should um, say, we're now, you know, agenda item 4.1. And then you don't have to read the entire title, but you could say, you know, tenant protection ordinance. So people know what's coming up. You invite staff commissioner to present the item. You ask members of the commission if they have questions of clarification. This should be specifically be clarification regarding the, the report. And then you invite public comments and then invite the motion, announce who made the motion, announce who seconded. Your commission secretaries will love you for this because when you have sometimes 13 people, you can't always tell who made the motion. So it's very helpful to say it out loud for the record, for your secretary and for the public. Um, after the motion, you guys can talk about the motion debate it and then vote. The vote must be verbal or shown on a public display screen. Announce the vote result and who voted no or abstained. If it's unanimous you can say you know the motion passed unanimously but if there's two no votes it's the motion passed with a nine to two vote with Commissioner Smith and Jones voting no. Um, so you want to say that out loud that's for members of the public to hear and it's for the record that's actually new, it's new in state law that you have to say it verbally or display it on a screen. So council policy, oh, I wanna go back to parliamentary procedures for a second. 
Um, one of the issues we have with parliamentary procedures is sometimes people want to really get into um, how the motions are made and who says the motions and they can get a little mean about it. This is to make a meeting move smoothly. It's not to punish somebody because they didn't word the motion exactly right. So be a little flexible with your parliamentary procedures. And we'll actually have another training specifically on Rosenberg's Rules of Order that's separate from this particular recording. Council Policy 04. So I stated earlier that this is our Consolidated Board of Commission Policy. It covers the recruitment, selection, appointment, and resignations of members, the requirements for the Boards and Commission members, how they're governed and operated, the Code of Conduct, and what their authority is. It's a very long policy. What are your roles and responsibilities? You need to attend meetings. You need to attend at least 50% of the length of the entire meeting. You will not generally know ahead of time whether or not a meeting is going to last an hour or two hours or three hours. So um, you may think that you're going to be there 50% of the meeting and you end up not being there. So you need to, to just plan ahead. Try to attend the full meetings if at all po possible. Notify your commission secretary in advance about excused absences. This will help. If we have five people absent then and now we don't have a quorum, we may as well cancel the meeting for lack of quorum rather than have everybody haul themselves down to City Hall on like a Thursday night and then you can't hold the meeting because five people were out and they all knew ahead of time they were going to be out. So it's just polite to notify the Commission Secretary. Um, you need to abide by the Code of Ethics and Code of Conduct. This is basically be dignified and courteous, be professional and respectful, and support the Chair's effort to conduct the meeting effectively and fairly. There's also Council Policy 015 and City Policy 1.2.2, both of which are the Code of Ethics for appointed officials. It requires you to demonstrate the highest standards of personal integrity, honesty, and conduct all it, and conduct in all activities in order to inspire public confidence and trust. City officials must treat all members of the public and other city employees and officials with respect, courtesy, concern, and responsiveness. It also requires you to avoid any conflicts of interest and appearance of conflicts of interest to ensure the city decisions are made in an independent and impartial manner. The role of the chair. The role of the chair is to preside at a meeting to run meetings in an orderly and efficient manner, manage conflicts that may arise, keep discussions on topic, stick to the agenda, and get through the agenda items in a timely manner. We conduct meetings in accordance with Robert's Rules of Order, um, and we have a handout to give out to people. Um, Institute of Local Government Understanding the Role of the Chair. We'll, we can get that posted on our website for you, for those of you who are taking the online training. So. The chair is empowered to act to prevent disorderly conduct and personal attacks and to enforce time limits, but to do so equitably. Criticisms of any acts or omissions of the commissions and its policies, services, and procedures is allowed. What, we, what you don't want to do is, as a chair is to play favorites, and somebody's agreeing with you, so you let them go a little off topic but somebody doesn't agree with you, you shut them down quicker. You need to really um, be very fair. When you're doing the two-minute timer on people, it's best to make stick to your two minutes um, because sometimes we have a tendency to maybe let somebody go a little bit over the two minutes because maybe we like what they're saying and maybe we don't like what another person's saying, so we really cut them off at two minutes to just keep it nice and fair and that nobody can say that your um, have an appearance of bias and then occasionally you have commission members who will argue and it's a, it is appropriate for the chair to, to step in and say okay we need to get back on topic you know we're, we're starting to attack people and to do so fairly and, and nicely and politely so being the chair is actually really important commission dues Okay, commission dues. Do make recommendations only on topics within the scope of authority set forth by council. Do use city stationery, including emails, only for official commission business. All correspondence com concerning commission's business should be sent with a copy to city commission staff. 
don't blindside your staff person. That's kind of the the gist there. Let them if you're if you're doing something officially for the commission, don't let the the commission secretary hear about it from somebody else. Place items on the council agenda in accordance with the rules, resolution, and commission work plan. Um, so generally, when you have an opinion that you want to express to council, you send a letter to the rules committee, and we put it on the public record. Um, it is called out separately in the public record as items coming from city from city commissions. But sometimes your letters may be um, go directly to the city council if if you've reviewed the council agenda and want to make a comment, say on tenant protection ordinance. You know it's coming. I'm going to pick a date where there's no council meeting, July 17th. Um, then that will just go directly to council as public record for there. But if you're doing a communication on something that's not already on an agenda, it goes to rules. And do make requests for information or for research from staff through the rules committee. So this is you, you already did your work plan for the year and now you want to add something new to the work plan. You want to add a special project. You need to take that back through your council committee and with a request to say we want to amend our work plan and add this extra project and then staff will do like a time analysis on how long they think that's going to take because your staff person is not just your staff person they have other jobs in the city as well so um, we need to make sure that they have time to get their their regular work done as well as the commission work Don't use your commission title to make personal political endorsements. Don't use your commission title to speak as a commissioner unless authorized by the commission. Don't interview candidates for political office or endorse such candidates using your title. And don't individually or as a body independently support or oppose legislation, including ballot measures. You may do this as a member of the public, but you cannot say I am John Smith neighborhoods commissioner and I endorse this candidate you can say I am John Smith a citizen of the city of San Jose and I endorse this candidate um, because it gives the appearance that the city is endorsing the candidate so you cannot use your title for things like that you will have on occasion a candidate who will know that you're a commission member and will automatically put that title like sometimes they'll have a website they'll list everybody who's donated money to them and they may say John Smith neighborhoods commissioner um, if you notice that, contact the, the candidate and ask them to remove the title. I often get it reported to me, and all I do is I contact the candidate and tell them to remove your title. Um, that's generally what happens, is you won't know they're using your title. Um, I'm not asking you to go Google yourself constantly to see if somebody's doing it, but if you see it or somebody reports it to you, then just contact that candidate. You could also shoot an email to the city clerk and say, hey, I, this, this happened, I already knew about it, I emailed the candidate, so sorry. That way, just in case somebody comes back later with a complaint, I've got a record that says, yeah, they knew about it, it's taken care of, it's not a big deal. Don't contact city consultants outside of commission meeting unless authorized by the city. Don't represent city or commission in front of other non-city entities without express approval from council. Again, on that last one, you can speak as an individual, just not as a commission member. Now, the don't contact city consultants outside of commission meetings unless authorized by the city. I'm going to give an example. If you're a Parks and Rec commissioner and you're at a park and you, you see the janitor service cleaning a bathroom and you're like, hey, the bathroom over on that other end is really dirty or could really or this, these bushes could really use some trimming. They may take that as an, a work order from a city staff person. And now you've cost the city extra money. <laughs> so just, it sounds it's kind of silly, um, but don't do that unless the city's asked you to do it. So if the city's said, hey, senior commission, we want you to go talk to um, the senior food vendors who do the senior food program, um, that's different. And okay, so this seems obvious don't accept money or favors for for performing your city du duties don't use confidential information you will occasionally get a draft report that um, is th to review and that's not final yet so if the staff asks you not to disseminate the draft don't um, don't discriminate against anyone and don't participate in any discussions if you have a real or perceived personal bias or conflict of interest i think we've now said that three times so clearly that one's really important. 
So I already mentioned this. So letters from commissions regarding council or council committee items, you'll submit to your commission secretary who will then forward it to the council or council committee themselves. If you're sending something to say VTA or to the county, you'll still submit to your commission secretary who will get authorization from the council committee and then submit um, on behalf. So you will always submit your letters to the commission secretary and then he or she will take care of it in the way that they're supposed to. So you guys don't have to remember what goes where, just make sure it just goes to your commission secretary and they will take care of it. Subcommittees. Standing committees made up of less than a quorum of the commission, um, their continuing subject matter jurisdiction or meeting schedule fixed by commission, they are a Brown Act body because they are being formed by the legislative body formed the commission, and so now the commission's a Brown Act body. If they f form a committee because it's basically has been formed by the original legislative body through a chain, they're a Brown Act body. That is why they're generally not allowed unless approved by the city council because that's now the secretary has another agenda to post, another meeting to attend, another minutes to prepare, so it's additional work. Ad hoc temporary committees are less than a quorum, specific short-term tasks or projects in less than six months. Our Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices has a temporary committee to look at um, potential ways to do public outreach. Um, it, they don't have to be Brown acted. There's no agenda. They can meet and talk to each other. There's two of them because it's a five member board and they can um, talk to each other and then report back to the committee. And it's temporary because it's not a, a major, it's not a long-term thing. You might also have a temporary committee formed to review the city council budget. The budget's, you know, a thousand pages long and say the Parks and Recreation Commission wants to know how that budget's gonna impact the Parks and Recreation Department. So they may appoint a temporary committee of a couple of people to go through that budget and then report back to the main committee. So that's kind of the purpose of the temporary committees. San Jose City Charter. So the City Charter establishes the Planning Commission, Civil Service Commission, and Salary Setting Commission. All other commissions are created by council and are limited by the functions, powers, and duties set forth in the, muni in the municipal code. Um, because the charter allows them to set, to create additional boards and commissions as needed. Some cities only keep their charter commissions that are required by state. Um, or they're not even charter commissions in a general law city, but they'll only, I worked at a city that only had a planning commission because it's required by state law and they had a library bond commission and the airport and ice commission because those were three that were required by state law and they had no other commissions. Um, but this city has more because they, were, when you have a population of a million people, the city council can't be everywhere. So this allows them to create, like we really want to know what art is like in the city and what we need. So let's ask these other people who are interested to give us some advice because we can't be everywhere. But um, all of those commissions are subject to direction and supervision. The Municipal Code 2.08 expressly sets forth your functions, powers, and duties and what constitutes an excused absence. Excuse absence, member's illness, illness or death of a member's spouse, domestic partner, parent, child, sibling or dependent, or your way on authorized city business. Going on vacation is not an excused absence, it's an unexcused absence. Um, a business trip, although you can't stop it, not an excused absence. You have an automatic resignation if you have unexcused absences from three consecutive regular meetings or more than 20% of the total number of regular meetings in a calendar year. So if you have to miss a meeting because of a business trip and it's unexcused, it is not a big deal um, as far as being resigned. It only becomes a big deal if you continue to miss meetings. Um, you can be reappointed by council if the council finds there was a good excuse for absences and is in the city's best interest. So I don't have any leeway. If you've missed three meetings in a row that are unexcused, I have to cut you. But we can submit a letter to the city council that says we resigned to this person because they missed three meetings, but the reason they missed these three meetings is, and then you give us the reason why. And if council feels that that was justifiable, they can reappoint you but I can't waive this. The municipal code defines what a quorum is. 
a quorum is the ma majority of the total number of seats, whether filled or vacant. So you have an 11 member commission, six is a quorum. If you only have nine members seated and you have vacancies, six is still a quorum. But voting is a little different. So it requires an affirmative vote of at least a majority of those present as long as there is a quorum. So if you have an 11 member commission, six is a quorum, but only seven members are attending at that time, you only need a vote of four, not a vote of six. Is that clear? Okay, because that one kind of gets confusing. Okay, so if you are a member of any of these commissions that are listed here, you'll want to stay and hear the rest of this. If you are not a member of any of these commissions, you can turn the video off and you will not have to listen to any more of the video. You are, you are done. So I'm pausing just for a second and now I'm going to move on for the Form 700 and Family Gift Report period. The Form 700 and Family Gift Report are due within 30 days of assuming or leaving office. So when you leave office, you think you're done, we're still going to bug you because we need to get that Form 700. This is a state requirement. So this is, we are not doing this because we want extra work. We are not bugging you when you leave office because we want to, we have to. If we don't, and you are late and the state gets it gets reported to the state either because they audited us or somebody else reported it you can get fined from the state and we don't want to do that that's also due every april 1st we often get people who are like but i just did one yeah you did one last year you have to do one every year that you're in office there is a ten dollar per day penalty for not filing up to a hundred dollars so if you file on april 2nd you will be fined ten dollars um, the state can find up to $5,000 for not filing and that we've actually seen it happen. Not necessarily for, in, for people here because we're pretty good about nagging everybody. Um, but we have seen it in the, the county of Santa Clara with $5,000 fines for people. Um, you do not have to report your personal residence address um, unless you're, you don't have to report your personal residence at all unless you're using it for rental income. So if you've got an Airbnb room, you're probably going to have to report it, but you should check with the FPPC to double check that. But you can use your APN and not your address. Um, that way people can't just say, oh, this person lives at this address, let's go over there. <clears throat> we also recommend on the first page you use the city or business contact address since it's a public record. All city employees who file a Form 700 just use City Hall as their address. And you can do the same thing as a commissioner. Um, I do not give advice on Form 700 because it is a state form and it has state requirements. So if you do not know how to fill it out, I suggest you, you contact the FPPC through their, they have a 1-800 number and they have an email advice. They also have a lot of, um, a lot of reference materials online. Okay, he just asked me, what is the FPPC? That's the Fair Political Practices Commission. It's a commission through the Secretary of State. So you can, if you Google, I think it's fppc.ca.gov is their website. But if you just Google California FPPC, you will find them. They're actually quite big here. They're very active. And we do not want them auditing us. So we really, really try to make sure everybody turns their stuff in when they're supposed to. Okay. So... The next required training is the ethics training AB1234 and AB 1661 sexual harassment discrimination training. That only applies to the following boards here. Um, I have nothing really to say about those. They are um, they are required by, by commissions where the state has either said this commission needs to do it or if the members are receiving a stipend. The sexual harassment training is new. It started January 1st, 2017. Um, it has to be completed within 90 days of appointment and then every two years thereafter. And once you complete it, you file your, your certification with the city clerk's office. If you are not compliant with these trainings that will be noted on the council memo for future reappointments, this training includes identifying and preventing abusive conduct or bullying behaviors, repeated use of derogatory remarks, insults, and verbal or physical conduct that a reasonable, per reasonable person would consider threatening, intimidating, or humiliating, as well as deliberately sabotaging or undermining someone's performance is not tolerated.
bullying has a negative effect on victims and others who are present on productivity and morale. Um, the ethics training and sexual harassment training are both online training, so you do not have to come in person to do those. I do want to go back to Form 700s real quick um, to let you know what a Form 700 is because I realized I didn't really define it. This is the conflict of interest report. So this says where you're, where you're getting your money. Um, you will not need to report sources of income outside of our jurisdiction. So if you own rental property in Nevada, you don't need to report that. If you own rental property within the city of San Jose, you would report that. So it is a conflict of interest statement. So moving forward, we have resources um, on our website, understanding the role of the chair attachment, as well as our website itself. And I think that's the last slide. No, questions and answers. You, are not, you guys are not present, you're online, so there is no questions, but you can always email um, city.clerk at sanjoseca.gov if you have questions. You can also attend an in-person training. We do these twice a year in July and January. Um, I think this year we're actually in August 2018, um, and then the next one will be January 2019. I thank you for taking the time to spend 46 minutes with the city clerk's office. And thank you, Adrian, for sitting in here and listening to me talk for 46 minutes and asking questions. So thank you, everybody.